I guess we're up and running again. Okay, so um, I haven't had a chance to look at your essays on the Dark Knight yet because I don't have Wi-Fi here, although I'll probably use my phone as a hotspot uh, today and, and get to look at that. I have Wi-Fi at, you know, our regular home, but this is uh, another place that we have up on Canandaigua Lake and we don't have Wi-Fi here. Uh, and our running joke has been, you know, we got tired of looking at the four walls in our regular house in Orchard Park. So we came up here so that we could look at four walls here. Okay. So anyway, a little bit different scene here. Okay. Um, but you guys have done such a good job all the way along that I'm sure you did a good job on those essays too. And it seems like now we have everybody back in the fold, and that's really important, okay? So, we're not all that far from the end, okay? I will calculate the hours um, in, in you know, the next few days and see exactly where we are. I know that we'll have at least one more class. I don't know if we have to have two more classes besides today or not. Um, but, you know, I'll be in touch and let you know. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, there will be a graduation for you guys. Um, I think there will be. The president allowed states to start reopening last night. But, um, of course, New York isn't going to start any of that reopening until May 15th. So your graduation can't be on time because in phase one, you can't have gatherings of more than 10 people. So, so that's not going to happen, okay? But maybe the middle of June or the end of June, something like that will happen, and that's all good. Okay, anyway, be that as it may. We've spent the semester on short stories, and what we did this past week uh, with the movie was to help you understand that each of those elements in a short story also pertain to films. And my desire in doing that was so that now when you watch movies, you won't walk out of there saying, oh, that was good. But as you're watching the movie, you'll be saying, oh, yeah, wow, look at how this character has changed from the beginning of the movie to the end. He can do so much more. Or look at how they brought setting into that whole thing. Or... Yeah, the plot jumped around, you know, it wasn't just a straight line plot, but we, we did some forward and backward kind of thing, okay? Uh, you know, all, each of those elements that we talked about during the course of the thing, okay? Or, yeah, you know, during the course of this movie, um, there was a first-person narrator, like if you've ever seen the movie Stand By Me, which is, which is a classic, you know, there's, there's a lot of first-person narration going on because it's from the point of view of somebody who is looking back over all these things he did in his childhood. So you probably have seen Stand By Me because it's such a cool movie, even though it's older than you guys are. Um, you know. So it, that was my goal so that, you know, because by and large people spend more time watching movies, watching television. Um, so, you know, the idea is that Going forward, you'll be analyzing stuff. You'll be taking the things from this course and using them on, on a regular basis, okay? Okay, so we're moving on from that genre now, the um, story kind of genre, into poetry today. Now, I can hear your groans. Well, don't. We are not going to be doing the kind of thing where we're asking you about rhyme and meter and da 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 We're not going to do that because I told you in the beginning that one of my big goals is to help you enjoy literature more. And if you think every time you look at a poem, you have to get into analyzing, 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 you know, which there's nothing wrong with, okay? Uh, but I, my hope is that you can look at a poem and and just enjoy what you're reading the same way you might enjoy a short story. Okay? Now, one of the critical things in reading poetry is not to read it line by line, but read it the same way you read prose, short stories. Read it by the punctuation. 
Okay, so let commas be a signal for you, let periods be a signal for you, etc. So read it, in a sense, sentence by sentence. Not line by line, but read it by the punctuation, the same way you read everything else. One of the things that normally makes poetry really difficult for us is that we tend to read it line by line. Okay, and, you know, and, and I mean, that's okay, but here's the thing. Here's the history of poetry that'll help you understand a little more why we have rhyme, why we have so much meter in poetry. Okay? Poetry really started thousands of years ago. And um, there, there were um, guys that were called traveling minstrels. They would travel from land to land and they would tell stories but they would tell stories that were written in rhyme and meter because that helped them remember them, okay? So, does this make sense? Sure. Think about the songs that you remember, okay? Generally, the songs that you remember are written, first of all, with a certain meter, and secondly, there is frequently a kind of rhyme with it. The same thing happens in poetry. When you hear things rhyming, you remember it. So, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, or couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, or exactly what the words are. I don't know. But you can see we have a meter in there so that, you know, your brain kind of goes along with it, da 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 da. And we have a rhyme in there because we remember rhyming words, okay? We remember things that rhyme. So, um, you know, that's why poetry is written that way, okay? But again, we aren't going to be delving into that. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of background on how poetry developed the way it did. So my goal is to help you look at some poems and just enjoy them for what they are. Now, during the course of, you know, earlier in the semester, we talked about the role of the narrator, okay? And we said that the narrator is not the author, he's a created character. Well, in poetry, that may or may not be the case, okay? In some poems, the narrator is the poet. And in some poems, the person giving you the poem is, you know, is the poet himself. Sometimes he's, he's a created character, a narrator, and sometimes he's the poet himself, okay? So it's not like a universal rule as short stories were, okay? So we're going to talk first about narrative poetry. We're going to talk about narrative poetry today, okay? And narrative poetry is poetry that's designed to tell a story, okay? So we're not going to do any analyzing. I'm going to give you a couple examples of narrative poems, and then on your assignment, I'm going to give you a bunch of narrative poems to choose from. You, could, you can also choose from the ones that, that I'll recite for you here today. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, then, then you have, you'll have to write about some narrative poems and, and delve into them a little bit, okay? But um, I, I wanted to give you some examples of narrative poems so you can get the idea that poetry can be something that's fun, Poetry can be something that, that uh, tells you a story. It narrates. It tells you a story, okay? Um, and poetry can be something that you can enjoy. It doesn't have to be, oh, my God, a poem, okay? So, um, one of my favorite poems, maybe my favorite poem, is a poem called Casey at the Bat, okay? And you've probably all heard Casey at the Bat before, uh, and, of course, I know that, you know, some of you even are, have been on the school baseball team, and I'm sure almost all of you have played baseball somewhere along the line. So, you know, you, you understand what baseball is all about, okay? Well, Casey at the Bat is a baseball poem, okay? And it goes like this. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. And so when Cooney died at first and Burroughs did the same, 
A sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope that springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, they'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a pudding and the latter was a fake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe on second and Flynn a hugging third. And from this gladdened multitude went up a joyous yell. It bounded from the mountaintops and rattled in the dell. It struck upon the hillside and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearings and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt, t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he, wiped, as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the wreathing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lips. And now the leather-covered fear came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by that sturdy batsman, the ball unheated sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visit shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more that spheroid flew. And Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, fraud! But a scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey would not let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing. And somewhere shall children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Okay. So that's an example of a narrative poem. Yeah, I love that poem. It's a great poem. You know, uh, Obviously I love it because I memorized it a long time ago. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible poem. Okay. But you see, it's telling a story. Now, yeah, there's a lot of emotion going on in it. You know, uh, And especially if you're a baseball player... You know, uh, like um, Jake and uh, who else in your class is baseball? Um, Jim um, and no, Luke McMahon is football, but I don't think he's baseball. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. So anyway, um, you know, we, we get all this emotion going on in there, but it's not an emotional poem, really. It's a poem that tells a story, Okay. And it's just a fun story. It's a great story. It's a story of we've all been there, you know. Uh, we've all been there, okay. So, um, you know, that's that's an example of a narrative poem. And we'll do more more narrative poems, okay. Um, the other kind of poetry that we'll look at, and not today, um, but next week, is the lyric poem. And the lyric poem is the poem... That's, that's really all about the emotional response, you know, getting emotionally involved, the, the, the poet or narrator trying to bring you emotionally into the poem, getting you to feel, uh, getting you to think about, um, you know, get, getting, 
getting you really involved on an emotional level rather than just like in this story, yeah, okay, if you're a baseball guy, you know, it's easy to get involved on, on uh, uh, an emotional level. But really, you know, it's a story. It, it, it's just a neat story like, like so many of the stories that we read. This is an example of a narrative poem. I'll give you another narrative poem that all of you are familiar with, The Night Before Christmas. And if you think about The Night Before Christmas, it rhymes, it rhymes, it rhymes, and the meter is the same. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimneys with care, and hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. Mama and her kerchief and I and my cat had just settled down for a long winter's nap. Okay, you know that story, okay? Well, that is a narrative poem. And again, it has rhyme and meter, but again, the rhyme and meter is, is really, initially, initially, so that people could memorize the poem. Okay? Another one of my favorite poems is a poem called The Cremation of Sam McGee. This was written by a fellow named Robert Service, okay? and it's a neat story of uh, guys who were looking for gold in the Yukon. Okay? This ties into uh, you know, what we did earlier in the semester when we were studying setting, and setting is, is a, a part of this poem. So we'll see if I can remember this poem too. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was at night on the marge of Lake LaVarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home down the south to roam around the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell, though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the parka's fold that stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd close, then the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and the stars overhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and capped, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, It's the cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clear through to the bone. Yet, taint being dead, it's the awful dread of an icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that, foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Well, a pal's last need is a thing to heat, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He sat in the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death as I hurried horror-driven with a corpse half-hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise I'd given. It was lashed to the sleigh and it seemed to say, you may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true. Now it's up to you to cremate these last remains. And every day that quiet clay seemed a heavy and heavier goal. But on we went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad and I felt half bad, half mad, but I swore I would not give in. I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern cold. In the days to come, though my lips were numb, and my heart how I loathed that load. And the long, long night by the lone firelight where the huskies, round in a ring, howled out their woes to the nameless foes. Oh, God, how I loathed that thing. Till I came to the marriage of Lake Barge and a derelict there light. Derelict is an old ship. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. I looked at it, and I thought a bit. Then I looked at my frozen chum. Now here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared and the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see. 
Then I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I shoved in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens howled, and the huskies growled, and the winds began to blow. Ooh, missed. Uh, it was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And an inky smoke and a greasy cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I gravely said, guess I'll take a look inside. It's time I looked, and it's probably cooked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile. You could see a mile. And he said, please close that door. It's warm in here, but I gravely fear you'll, get it, you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things dawn in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Okay, so that's another example of a narrative poem, a poem that tells a story, a pretty cool story. And again, you guys all have a little bit of background that because, in that because you all did a little bit of research on sighting in the Yukon. So, so you get it, you know? Okay, so these are narrative poems. Poems that tell a story. Hopefully you get the idea that poetry does not have to be something that you need to be afraid of. Poetry can really be pretty cool stuff. Okay? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a list of poems. Um, and and I, I want you to choose from there. And again, you can choose, you know, the, the two that I recited for you or the night before Christmas or whatever. And delve into them. And, and um, you know, I'll, I'll give you the assignment of, of uh, how you can relate to a narrative poem. Okay? So, um, you guys have a good week. Keep up the good work. And um, I will be back with you soon. Okay? And I'll get your papers corrected uh, on uh, the dark night and get those off to you quickly, too. Take care and stay safe.